Hello and welcome to another CS0 Intro to Java Programming video. In this video, we're going to talk, on, uh, talk about creating your first Java JFrame project and also how to open projects in IntelliJ. Let's start off with opening projects. In the last video, you may recall that we created a new project and um, made a basic Java file that uh, made a print line statement that uh, greeted us, a hello world project, if you will. And we saved it in a project folder called first project. And here's our Java file right here. This is our project folder. The project folder is always going to contain all the stuff that we need in IntelliJ to run and compile and all of the settings that IntelliJ needs to run and compile the file properly. There's an output directory which is going to contain our Java bytecode. There's a source folder that's going to contain our actual Java class files that we write, the living and breathing code. Let's talk about how to open up one of those in IntelliJ. I have a bunch of lecture files that I've created in, in preparation for these videos and I'm going to open up some of those in IntelliJ. So I'll click on open. Now if you, you know, if you didn't close out of a project and close out of IntelliJ, when you open up um, IntelliJ you're going to see your last project open. So if I didn't close my project we'd see something like this. Okay, when I open IntelliJ the first time, this is going to pop up. So if you wanted to open a project from here, you can go File and Open. If you don't have a project open, kind of like this, when you open up IntelliJ, you're going to get this panel here. To open a project, you just click Open, and then you browse for it. So if I was going to look for that first project one, I would go to Seagoral, I would go to Desktop, I would go to CS0 projects and I would find first project. Now, this isn't going to be in exact instructions for finding your project. As I said in the previous video, I'm working on a Windows computer, you may not be. You might be on a Mac, you might be on a Linux box, you might be on some other type of machine. Your file system is going to look different. You might have all of your files stored on uh, the D drive or the F drive or, or, or another drive entirely. Your file organization might not look like mine. You might have saved it into documents instead of desktop. Well, it's your responsibility to know your file system, know where you save things, and be able to browse and look for your projects. So I can't help you exactly with that. I could just tell you that when you want to open a, file, uh, a Java project, you have to browse for it. Now, Java projects look like this. They're going to be their containing folder, and that containing folder that is an IntelliJ project is going to have this little black box with a dash in it down in the lower right corner of the folder. Okay, This is the project folder. This is what you need to open. The project folder is going to contain an IML directly inside of it. If this were nested in another folder and you open up the containing folder, your project won't really properly open. You won't be able to run and compile files and you'll just have some problems. So make sure that when you open a Java project, you're looking for this little black box because that indicates that it's an IntelliJ project and you can open it. So I'll click on that, click OK, and it'll launch my file. Now let's say you already had a project folder open and it's, it's in your IDE like this and you want to open another one. We'll go up to File, Open, and then we'll browse for it. I have some in my Dropbox, and it's in this directory right here. It's in Lecture Files, and I'm going to open up this one that says Week 1. This is going to be the project that's going to have all the files that I'm going to cover in the next five or six videos or so. I'm going to go step by step go through each of the files in there, and by the end of it we're going to build up a Java J frame that has an image in it, it has a button, um, we're going to look at how to do uh, um, J text fields and J labels and um, action listeners and all kinds of stuff. But we're going to take it step by step and look at each and every one of those files in there. So to open this, you click OK and you're going to get this prompt here. It's going to say 
new projects can either be opened in a new window or place a project in the existing window. How would you like to open it? Well, if you wanted to have multiple projects open at the same time, like I often do, I would click on new window. If I don't care about the project that's currently open, I can click new window, it'll close the project that's currently open and open my new one. Since I'm not going to go back to this first project one, I'm done with it, I'm just going to click on this window and it's going to replace that project that was currently open. So there we go, I've got my week one stuff open and the first project one is closed. All right. Um, I have a bunch of Java files up on the uh, tabs bar here. I'm going to close them all for now and I'm going to just open up the one that I want. So there are a couple ways of doing this. I can double click on the source folder and it'll expand this. I can click on this project browser here and expand that and it'll open up my browser and I can find my files. Now let's take a look at this directory here. Week 1 is going to have several folders in it, containing folders. It's going to have an out directory, a source directory. If we browse for this here, you're going to see that it matches this. Okay, so lecture files has week 1. You can see week 1 is right there. Inside of there, there's the idea, images, out, source, IML. Idea, images, out, source, IML. And then our external libraries and scratches and consoles and everything like that. These folders are going to contain what you see in here. So if I go into source here, you're going to see I've got unit 1, that's my package, and then all of my Java's and an image file, which we have right here. These Java's here are the living, breathing code. And what I mean by that is, if I open these up in the editor, I can modify that code, I can change it and stuff like that. Okay? The output directory is going to contain my compiled output. The compiled output is going to be these files right here that say dot class. Dot class is not something that I can open in my editor and, um, and edit. These are bytecode files. So let's talk a little bit about the lifespan of a Java file. When we open a Java file, we write a whole bunch of code. The computer itself can't read this code that's in English. We have to translate it. The computer's processor can only take things in as the um, basically switching on and off switches, basic instructions, um, really that's, that's in binary code. Well, this is not that. This is Java code, this is all English words, things that when we read it we can understand. The processor can't understand this stuff. We can't really understand the stuff that the processor understands. So we have to write the code in a language we understand, and then we have to translate it into a language that the processor can understand. And that's what the process of compiling is. Java is a compiled language. That means that after you write the code, we press this button, and it's going to transform that code into another type of file. So see I ran it, my frame popped up, when I come over to the projects folder, it's going to create one of these files here. These are our Java bytecode. Java bytecode is a portable kind of code that can be run in any machine that is going to have a uh, Java runtime environment. So you can put a Java runtime environment on basically any kind of computer, any kind of operating system that accepts Java. You can put it on things like a smartwatch, you can put Java on things like a smart refrigerator, a TV, all kinds of devices are going to have Java on them. And any machine that has one of those Java runtime environments can take one of these class files, one of these bytecode files, and then interpret it into a language that that machine's processor can understand. And then it'll do all the switching on and off of the switches and moving data from one memory location to another and basically making the computer do what you're telling it to do. The computer cannot read this stuff right here and do that, so we have to interpret it into a language the computer can understand. That's the process of compiling the code. These class files, if you open them in the editor, you're going to see that we can't edit these. I'm trying to type in it. I can't do that. You're going to get this little message up here, decompiled.classfile, bytecode version 54.0, Java 10. Yours might say a different version and 
stuff like that. But essentially what this is telling you is that this is bytecode that IntelliJ has done a retranslation job of putting it back into Java. But it's not living, breathing code. I can't do anything with it. I can't run it without having a runtime environment doing the interpretation and telling the processor what to do. So a lot of times new students when they encounter this they'll just open up the class file and they'll try and run it and they, they'll get confused as to why things aren't happening. Well, dot class means it's bytecode. Dot java means that it's the code that you edit and it's the living breathing code. All right, that's a little bit about the process of, uh, of writing code, compiling code, and executing code. Let's get into the actual code itself. This is our first JFrame class here. A JFrame looks a little something like this. Run it, pops this up on the screen. This is a JFrame. A JFrame is going to have this box that's going to have, you know, might have some stuff in it. It's going to have the minimize, maximize, and close buttons on it. JFrames are a special container in Java that will be able to contain things like GUI elements, like buttons and fields and labels and text areas. It'll contain things like graphics context, which is like a clear screen on which we can draw things. It's going to contain all the things that we interact with in a program. That's what the JFrame is. It's a special container. In this class, in CS0, we're going to do everything through the JFrame. So it's really important that you understand how a JFrame works. Let's take a look at this naked empty JFrame here and how we created it. In the previous video, when we made a file, we just went new Java class, first Java, click OK, and we gave it a main method. And we said that the main method was like our launch pad for the file. And we put a couple of system out print lines in there, and, and then we went. Well, there's going to be a difference between a JFrame class and just a standard Java application. Let's take a look. We saw the method, or the class header before, public class first Java. And this tells Java that this is a Java class, and it's called first Java. Well, when we make a JFrame, the header is going to look a little bit different. Public class basic GUI template extends JFrame. This is telling Java that not only is it a Java class, but it is also a class of type JFrame. JFrame is a class that somebody else wrote. It's code that, that a group of developers wrote to perform the task of bringing one of these frames up onto the screen so that we can display stuff and, and create interactive programs. All right, Somebody else wrote that code we are going to build on that existing code. We're going to do something called extending the code. Now, this is a concept called inheritance. We're going to not really get into inheritance in this class, aside from the fact that we're going to extend classes that other people have written. Inheritance is also the idea that you can write your own classes and, and extend them. Um, you'll get that in an object-oriented programming course at another time. But for now, just know that when we make a JFrame class, we're building off of the code that somebody else already wrote. So this public class basic GUI template is a JFrame. Now let's take a look at some of the things that, we, that we're going to see in all of our JFrame classes. We're always going to see the main method. Remember, I said in the last video, main method is like our launch pad. It is the thing that Java is going to look for to start all applications. It's no different in JFrame. So in a JFrame, we have our main method. Also, in most of the videos that I'm going to make, I'm going to start off with a, vid with a method here called create GUI. This is a method that I'm creating. It's not from Java. It's not from uh, JFrame. It is a method that is, is unique to this class right here. I'm writing it. I'm going to define it. I'm going to make things happen in there. And you'll see us coming back to that time and time and time again. Get used to it. It's going to be one of our class conventions. So this one right here is required by Java. This one right here is not, but it's something that we create to make things happen. 
let's take a look at some of the lines and programming statements in this code. Line 9 here. This one right here is necessary for the way that we are creating JFrames. Now I'm going to tell you that when you write a program, there are many, many, many ways to do it. And if you look online and look for ways of creating JFrame applications, you might find different ways of doing it that look nothing like this. Someone might look simpler to you, someone might look more complex. I'm teaching it in this way because I believe that it's, a, it's this, one of the simplest ways to learn how to make a JFrame where everything is sort of self-contained. This right here is called instantiating an object. I'm not going to get too deep into the relationship between class and object in this video. That's going to come in another lesson in the future. But just know that this line of code has to happen every time you make one of these JFrame classes in the way that I'm making it. Some of the things that you'll notice. Basic GUI template, basic GUI template. These two things have to be exactly the same. Java is also case sensitive. In other words, if this is uppercase leading basic and then camel case thereafter, this has to be as well. If I make this lowercase b, you're going to see I'm going to get an error. It's going to say cannot resolve symbol basic GUI template. That means that Java can't find a type basic GUI template with the lowercase case b. Well, you might say, well, it's right here. But like I said, Java is case sensitive. In other words, it looks at the uppercase versus lowercase of any identifiers and they have to match. So now we're OK, because these things match. This right here is a type for a variable. This right here is a variable. We'll get into what variables are in a future episode. But just know a variable is like a box that we can put things in. This right here is the instantiation of our object. This is where we're bringing our JFrame object to life. We're actually creating it. I'll go into more detail on what creating an object is in a future video. But we need this, new basically template, and then these parentheses. So this line is going to be on every one of your Java classes, but for each um, JFrame class, this class name has to match this. And we'll see this in some of the other examples. If we look at drawing strings, you'll see that the drawing strings instantiation right here matches the class name there. OK? Great. So line 9, we've covered that. That's the instantiation of an object unto ourselves. Here, frame. This is the object's name. And we can work on these objects. What we can do is we can modify the way these objects are behaving through methods. We can make them do stuff. So I created this frame variable here. I put an object in it. And I can use that frame variable and do stuff to it. So frame dot set size. This right here is the dot operator. That dot operator means that we are working on some sort of an object with a method. This right here is a method invocation, or also what we call a method call. When we have a method call, what happens is the execution of our program jumps to another place in the code and executes all statements in that method and then comes back to this place. We'll see how that happens with the create GUI method in just a second. But this method right here is going to set the size of the frame. Watch this. Right now it's 400 by 600, and you saw that it was 600 pixels tall by 400 wide. I'm going to set this to 100, and you'll see that the frame looks really different than it did before. Notice it's much shorter than it was before. I'm going to set this to 600, run it. You'll see now the frame is 600 pixels tall. So we look at these two J frames and you see the difference. This is my 100 pixel tall J frame, this is my 600. So as I said, these method calls modify the behaviors of whatever object they're working on. So if we're working on that J frame, we can set the size of it. Frame.createGUI. This is another method call. And here's the way Java works. When it encounters one of these method calls, it's going to search our class for a method with this signature. And what I mean by signature is the name of the method plus any arguments in the parameter. So it's going to look through this class basic GUI template and look for a method header that says create GUI with these parentheses and nothing inside it. So we're going to scan down and see if we can find it. Oh, hey, it's right there. Create GUI. So since Java found a matching method signature, Java is going to jump its execution to this point. So Java executes code line by line by line by line. 
And when it comes to a method call, it's going to find that signature, and it's going to jump to the next line in that method. And it has to execute everything inside that method before that method terminates, and it can go on to the next line in the previous context. So create GUI. The, this method is going to be used to create all of our GUI components, all of our buttons, all of our text fields, all of our labels, all that kind of stuff. We don't have anything in there right now. Here are some things that we're going to do on every JFrame. First, set default close operation, exit on close. You're just going to do that. What's it, what it's going to do is it's going to, when you click on the X button on the frame, it's going to kill that process and um, it's going to make sure that it's not running. If you don't have this, that process can still run in the background even though the frame is closed. We don't want to do that on our frames. So just make sure you do this on every single one of your JFrames. Next thing we're going to always do on JFrames is create this container thing and we're going to get our content pane. At least we're going to do that for now. I'm not going to explain in depth too much what the content pane is. Just know it's, I think of it like almost a, a metal magnet board where I can pin magnets to that board and I can move those magnets around. We can think of our GUI components as magnets being pinned to a magnet board. So a J button is like a magnet I can place on that magnet board. And that content pane is that thing that I put that button on. So when I create a JFrame in the way I'm doing it in these projects, I need to get that content pane, and I'm going to store it in a variable called window. And later on, in a future video, you're going to see how I'm going to use that window object, and I'm going to call methods to it to add components to the window. All right? I have no other statements in here, so we'll get to the end of my, my, my method, and the method terminates. When we terminate this method, Java's execution goes to right where it left off. So it executes this method, gets to the end of it, and we move on to the next one. Frame.setVisibleTrue. This is the last thing that we need to do for every single JFrame. If we don't set visible to true, I'm going to comment this out. I'll run this, and you'll notice that the JFrame never pops up. It's, you know, it runs, but it doesn't pop up. Set visible true will make sure that when you run it, the JFrame pops up. All right, there's the basics of a JFrame. Every single JFrame that you create is going to have this standard stuff. In the next video, I'm going to show you how to modify this, modify this file. We're going to look at another example that I created that uses a text field and a label. And we're going to see how those things are created, and then we're going to modify this basic GUI template to have a text field and a label. And then we're going to look at some other files in future videos, see what kind of components we add to those, and then we're going to modify this basic GUI template again. And by the end of this unit of videos, you're going to see our basic GUI template is going to have an image in it with some text over it. It's going to have a button that's interactive that when the button is pressed, the image and the text pop up. It's going to be a fully interactive JFrame. But in order to do that, you're going to have to stick around. Thanks for watching this video, and I hope to see you in future videos. Have a good one.